Welcome to the Law of the Lord podcast, a production of the Newton Church of Christ in Newton, North Carolina. The aim of this podcast is to study God's Word for a deeper understanding and to see how it applies in our lives. We encourage you to search the Bible to see whether or not we are speaking truth, because the Bible is the truth. It is the law of the Lord. In this episode, we study church membership. And what we want to notice is, in spite of the fact that many people deny the necessity of church membership, the Bible teaches us that it is essential to being a child of God. It teaches that we are to be a part of the universal church, and without being a part of that church, we have no relationship with God, but then also that we must be a member of a local congregation where we pull together with others to work and to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening, and please be sure to hit the subscribe button in your podcast app. Also, we welcome your comments and questions at lawofthelord.com slash podcast. That's lawofthelord.com slash podcast. Now let's study the law of the Lord together. Most people want to belong to an organization, some type of group, a club. They spend thousands of dollars sometimes to be a part of these things. Some of them are worthy and some of them are not worthy. There are causes that align with things taught, the principles of the Word of God. There are other things that are aligned with that which is evil, that which is contrary to the will of God. There are some of these organizations that discriminate based on things like gender, like the National Association of Women Business Owners, or they discriminate based on the color of your skin, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. There are others that look at your social status. You think about a country club and how you need to have a certain standing, perhaps, within a community, certain recommendations, certain connections in the community before you're considered to be a member. There are others that would delineate based on what they might consider your intelligence or brain power. There's an organization called Mensa that only allows people of a certain IQ to be a part of it. So there's all kinds of organizations out there, groups and clubs, that discriminate for a number of reasons. Some discriminate for reasons that we might consider to be legitimate. Others, they discriminate just wholly arbitrary, and maybe because of prejudices that they have. The basis of memberships in these things usually is some type of charter or creed that pulls the people together. There are certain values, there are certain terms that they use, certain rules that they have that the members are expected to agree to and abide by? Well, there is one group of which all men ought to be a part, and that is the church of Christ, the church belonging to Christ. There's no payment that's required. For instance, like becoming a part of a country club, you might have to put down a certain amount of money, and then you're allowed to join, and then you have those monthly dues and things like that. But you don't pay to become a member of the Church of Christ, and there's no discrimination to be a part of the Church of Christ. It's a universal organization. It's something to which the Lord calls all men to join, if you will, to be a part of, we should say. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 28, it says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And that's simply saying there's no discrimination based on these arbitrary things, but rather that all people are welcome to be a part of the Lord's church. And it's not founded on man's creed. The church we read about in the Bible is founded on The Word of God is founded on the truth. In Colossians 3, verse 17, it says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. 
So it is something that is founded upon and directed by the authority of Jesus Christ as expressed in the New Testament. This organization, if you will, this group, this church founded by Jesus Christ has worthy goals. The goal of the church is the salvation of souls, the idea of men being turned from their sins and eventually having a home in heaven. The terms of membership are determined by the Lord. He died for the church. He gave his life for the church. He established it, and he is the head over it. As Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 says, that he is over the body of Christ. He is the head of that body. And so he has the authority to direct that body. And Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, Jesus said, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. And so it is governed by his will. And let's understand that those who are a part of the church, those who truly are a member of the blood-bought body of Christ, they're the best companions in the world. They're the best associates to have around, if you will. The privilege of membership in the church of Christ, let's understand, brings certain obligations with it as well. So let's break this down a little bit further and think about this universal church and how that membership in it is required of somebody who would hope to have salvation and eternal life with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in heaven. And we want to begin this by looking at Acts chapter 9 and thinking about Saul of Tarsus. We know him better as the Apostle Paul, but in Acts chapter 9, he is still known as Saul of Tarsus, an enemy of the people of God. In Acts 9 verse 1, it says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters. And so he wanted to go to Damascus and find those who were devoted to Christ and drag them off to prison or to be punished, executed physically. So you think about this, that this apostle Paul, or rather Saul of Tarsus, is contrary to the will of God, but he encountered the Lord on the road to Damascus. Picking up in Acts 9 verse 3, it says, As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven, then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. So again, to recap this, he was on the road. The Lord confronted him, and he asked, Who are you, Lord? Then Jesus responded, that I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. The next thing we read in Acts 9 verse 6 is Saul addresses him as Lord. Lord, what do you want me to do? So he has believed at this point that Jesus is Lord. And when we read down here in verse 9, he's three days without uh, sight and neither ate nor drank. And then you go a little bit further and you read where Ananias was told to go into him. And he's told that when he would find Saul, that he was praying. So this man is penitent. Saul of Tarsus believed on the road to Damascus that Jesus was the Christ. And he was penitent of his sins. He was sorry he had done them. That's indicated by not eating nor drinking. He's fasting. He, he's in mourning, essentially, here. And it says he's also, in Acts 9, 11, praying to God in heaven. So he is one 
that has had a change of mind in his life, going from being one who denied Jesus was Lord to accepting that Jesus was Lord. But I want us to understand that at this point, he's not been saved. At this point, he is not a member of the church of Jesus Christ. Because in Acts 9, verse 6, when he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? The Lord said to him, arise and go into the city. You'll be told what you must do. So Jesus doesn't tell him what he needs to do to to be right, to get his life right. Well, when Saul is later recounting this in Acts chapter 22, he tells of the fact that when he was in Damascus, there was a preacher by the name of Ananias that was sent to him. And when Ananias comes to him, in Acts 22, verse 16, it says, And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So you see, when he was there for three days without sight, he wasn't eating, he wasn't drinking, he was praying over that time. When the preacher finally came to him, the preacher told him he needed to get up and be baptized to wash away his sins. That means his sins were still on him. He was still separated from God at that point, but when he was told to arise and be baptized and wash away his sins, the original account, Acts 9, verse 18, says that he arose and was baptized. So that's when his sins were forgiven. Now, let's go back to Acts 2. Let's connect what the New Testament is teaching here about the relationship of baptism to salvation to being a member of the body of Christ or the church of Jesus Christ. So we go back to Acts chapter 2, and verse 38. Peter tells the people on the day of Pentecost that they need to repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So when he says you need to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, He's saying you need to repent and be baptized to be saved, to have your sins taken away. Now, again, let's connect. What did Saul of Tarsus do? Saul of Tarsus repented and was baptized so that his sins could be washed away. Peter's just using slightly different language and saying that your sins may be remitted. So that's Acts 2.38. You keep reading down through Acts chapter 2, you get to verse 47. The latter part of verse 47 says, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So when people believed, repented, and were baptized, their sins were remitted, their sins were washed away, they were saved. And when they were saved, Acts 2, 47 the Lord added them to the church. Now, that's the universal body of Christ, which is made up of all the saved. The universal church is made up of those who called on the name of the Lord. Remember, again, I want to cite for you Acts 2, 22, 16. And if you need to reach out to us and get these references, if you're listening to this, maybe on a ride or you're working out or you're jogging or whatever it may be, we will get these references to you. But Acts twenty two sixteen. and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's how you call on the Lord, is believing, repenting, confessing Him, Romans 10, 9 and 10, and being baptized. In 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2, it says, To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. You see how it says those who call on the Lord are saints. They're sanctified in Christ Jesus. They're called to be saints. These saints are described as heirs in 1 Peter 1, verses 2 to 5. They're described as priests in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. All Christians are priests. 
In 1 Peter 4, verse 16, it simply describes them as Christians. It's the idea of being a disciple of Christ, a follower of Jesus Christ. So, when you look into the Word of God and you see what happens when someone is saved per the commandments of the Lord and the apostles, when they follow that pattern that's been given, the commands, the directions, what they must do to be saved, that they are baptized, and when they are baptized, their sins are washed away, and the Lord at that point adds them to the church. They become an heir. They become a saint. They become a priest. They truly become a Christian. Until that happens, a person is not a Christian. Now, membership in the universal church, let's understand very clearly, is not determined by money. In 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, it says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. See, the blood of Christ is what washes away our sins. Now, that happens when we are immersed in water, when we submit to the commands of Jesus Christ. But we are not saved by money, by donating money, giving money. You know, some organizations, they allow you to become a member if you donate a certain amount of money. Not so with the church of our Lord. And we're not a member of the universal church by the decree of man. Man doesn't determine it, not any individual man nor group of men. In Colossians 2, verse 8, it says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Traditions of men do not make one a member of the body of Christ. In fact, traditions of men kick one out of the body of Christ. It, it's a sinful thing to follow the doctrines and commandments of men. Being a part of the universal church is not the result of associating with a local church either. Just because you attend a local assembly that calls itself a church or calls itself a Christian organization of some kind doesn't mean that you're a part of the universal church. You look into the New Testament and you can see that teaching very clearly. Nowhere is someone declared to be a part of the body of Christ based on the fact that they show up at services of a local congregation. Now, men can make a judgment on whether or not someone is a member of the universal church. They need to ask questions to see if that person followed the pattern given in the Scripture that we've already talked about, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. You see, because not everyone who says they are a Christian is a Christian, many have been deceived by false doctrines, the doctrines and commandments of men, into thinking that they are a Christian when they haven't done what the Bible says. And that's a problem. That It's very sad that many have been led into a false sense of confidence and assurance. You know, membership in the universal church is by a specific pattern revealed in the Bible. And when somebody becomes a part of that church, the church of Jesus Christ, we're talking about the body of all the saved, there are obligations to that. One of the obligations is faithfulness to the Lord. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus states it this way, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So daily living for the Lord is something that is required of a person who is a Christian. They are required to pray. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17, pray without ceasing. They're required to grow. 2 Peter 3 verse 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They're required to teach. Acts 8 verse 4 says that those who are scattered 
based on the persecution of Stephen that took place in Jerusalem. But it says in Acts 8, verse 4, therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. There are other things we could notice as we go through the New Testament about duties, responsibilities of being a child of God, but those are just a few to emphasize the point that there are obligations. It's not as though you can become a part of the body of Christ and then live life how you want to live it. And one of the obligations that we want to think about is membership in a local congregation. So when you become a Christian, when you repent, confess, and are baptized based on your belief, conviction that Jesus is Christ the Lord, when you do those things and your sins are remitted, the Lord adds you to the universal church, well, he then tells us that we need to become a part of a local church. Let's go back to the example of Saul of Tarsus. In Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 9, remember he was in Damascus when he was converted. He was baptized there. His sins were forgiven. It tells us in Acts 9 verse 20 that immediately he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. So he began to teach and to preach. Well, there were Jews there who became angry about that and wanted to kill him. So he had to leave Damascus and he returned to Jerusalem. So this some time has passed here, many years have passed, and he ends up going to Jerusalem. In Acts 9 verse 26, it says, when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem coming in and going out. So Saul became a member of the church at Jerusalem. He was a member at Damascus before that. But he had to leave. He gets to Jerusalem, and it says again in Acts 9, verse 26, he tried to join the disciples. So this is a local congregation. He wants to be among them, be identified with them. That word join there comes from a word, according to Thayer's Greek-English lexicon, that means to glue, to glue together, to submit, to fasten together. The idea is to fasten firmly, to join oneself to, and to cleave to. And this was a process that took place. When you read this account, again, Acts 9, 26 to 28, Paul made the effort, Saul of Tarsus as he's known here, but he made an effort to become a part of that local church. He expressed his desire. He wasn't a member, and he says, I want to be a part of of this organization here, this local church in Jerusalem. The church exercised its right of authority and inquired to find out whether or not he was faithful. They, they knew he had persecuted Christians in the past, and they don't want to receive him because they're not sure whether or not he is a child of God, whether or not he's saved and serves the Lord. But they then were told by Barnabas that indeed, Saul of Tarsus is a faithful child of God. This isn't a ruse to get in among you and find out who all is a member of the church at Jerusalem and turn their names in and drag them off to prison and all those kinds of things, that he's faithful. And so there is a mutual agreement. Saul said, I want to be a part of this group. The group then, when they found out he was faithful, accepted him. So there is this mutual agreement between them. And in Acts 9, verse 28, again, it says he was with them at Jerusalem coming in and going out. So he was assembling with them. He was working with them. He, he was a part of that local church. And what this is telling us by an approved example in the Bible, that Christians need to be a part of a local church. If you read through the New Testament, you can see that is abundantly clear as there are congregations that are set up, and the reason they're set up is because the apostles were directed by the Holy Spirit that local churches needed to be established. They needed to be assembled. Christians in an area need to come together. Let's understand that membership in a local church is not by baptism. 
Just because you became a Christian doesn't mean you're a member of a local congregation. It is not by family association or association with friends. It's not by assumption. People don't just assume it. And it's not by attendance. Just because you show up at services with a group doesn't mean that you're a member of that local group. Some places, that's the way they act. Some places, they just assume things. But scripturally, biblically, according to the New Testament, membership is not by assumption or attendance or any of those other things we just mentioned. There's a deliberate effort and a mutual agreement between the individual and the local congregation. Ideally, the local church consists of those who are faithful and loyal to Jesus Christ. That's the ideal. And when you read through the New Testament, you know, Ephesians, Colossians, Thessalonians, Churches of Galatia, Corinthians, what you read about is essentially these groups are geographically located, right? It's not like people are part of a local congregation when, you know, some are from Corinth and some are from Ephesus and some are from Jerusalem or Damascus. Now, the members of that local church are in that local area. Maybe that goes without saying. But they're geographically located and they are autonomous. They are self-governing or self-directed under the Word of God, of course. But they have no ties to one another. In Philippians chapter 1, in verse 1, Paul writes, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. So they have bishops in the New Testament. They're also known as elders or shepherds or pastors. They had their own leaders in that local congregation. They were independent under that leadership as they all strove to follow the will of God. In 1 Peter 5, Beginning in verse 1, it says, The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when Christ, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Now, you notice there when he's addressing elders, who are, again are also known as bishops or pastors in the New Testament, that he says, shepherd the flock of God which is among you. Not one that's, you know, 100, 200, 500 miles away, or not even one that's two miles away, but a different and separate group. But you shepherd the flock that is among you, so that local congregation. Again, churches in the New Testament, Philippi, Ephesus, Colossae, Thessalonica, all those churches were independent, autonomous congregations. Membership in a local church, of course, brings mutual obligations as well. In Hebrews chapter 10, 24 and 25, it says there, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So there's a mutual obligation to exhort, to encourage one another, to assemble together, to worship together. That's not an optional thing. Some people, especially you look out into denominations, community churches, there are people who really think that you know it's optional whether they go or not. A lot of people have that mentality. Of course, community churches, denominational churches, are not churches that you read about in the New Testament. They're the works and the products of men. So we'll leave that discussion aside for a minute. But in the New Testament, you become a Christian. You're obligated to become a part of a local congregation of like-minded Christians not just any religious organization, but a local church where others are saved like you are. So you become a part of that, and then you are required to 
get to the assemblies, to attend, to be there, to strengthen, encourage, build one another up. There's a requirement, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, to contribute to the work financially. You know, give as you have been prospered on the first day of the week. There is the requirement to submit to the leadership in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7. It says, remember those who rule over you and have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow concerning the outcome of their conduct. Verse 17, obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls. So there is the obligations of following the leadership that's been appointed over the congregation. So there are obligations with that relationship, or as there are with any organization you become a part of. There are certain obligations, certain things you're expected to do in order to be a member in good standing. It's really no different with the New Testament church that we read about in the Bible. So consider these things. First of all, are you a Christian? If you've not done what the Bible says to believe Jesus is the Christ, to repent of your sins, to confess him before men and be baptized, that's immersed in water for the remission of sins for that purpose, not to be a part of a local church or some denominational body, but you've been immersed with the understanding, your conviction, that it's to have your sins washed away. If you've not done that, then you're not a Christian. We encourage you to become a Christian. We want to help you to do that. And then we encourage you that you find a local church that belongs to Jesus Christ and join in the work there. And we can help you find one. We can help you find one in your area, Lord willing. There are many throughout our country and around the world that are simply following the New Testament as their rule of faith and practice. And we want to help you to be a part of a group like that so that your soul can be saved. Thank you for listening to the Law of the Lord podcast, a work of the Newton Church of Christ in Newton, North Carolina. Find out more about us and access more study material on our website, lawofthelord.com. That's lawofthelord.com. Reach out to us with any questions or comments about this episode. We also welcome Bible questions that we can answer either personally for you or address on a future episode of this podcast. We look forward to hearing from you.